Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. No, I'm I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Before we get started, we'd like to check in and see what's going on with each other's lives. And I'm going to start this week because uh, there's some controversy happening in the world. And with our election coming up very soon here in the U.S., I am drawing a clear line in the sand that I am not saying who I am voting for in this election, whether it be Donald Trump or Clinton, until they tell me definitively what their stance is on cargo shorts. Okay, hold on. Like, people need to calm down because this is my whole my whole twitter feed this last week has been just chock full of these cargo shorts like people have very strong opinions on cargo shorts and i gotta tell you the cargo short industry is gonna do fine okay my husband is holding that whole industry up (laughs) now mind you he's making a play for the (laughs) basketball short industry Uh, so i don't know like maybe we could get some sponsorship or what's going on there but i've somehow convinced him to start wearing polos so like we're we're going up from band shirts to polos and like wait so, wait so, so, there's, that, more, so there's a potential combination where he's wearing basketball shorts and polos <laughs> regularly so i'm i'm like i finally got him to upgrade from the waist up and we we've, we've now transitioned from cargo shorts into this like the basketball shorts and they they're getting larger like looser so <laughs> it's just yeah. Well, you, you know who's uh, the only person's opinion that I'm gonna trust in this matter is you, John, because I've I don't think I've seen you wear shorts in ten years. So if there's someone who has an opinion on shorts, it's a man who doesn't wear them. So let me just say we all know who cargo cargo shorts guy is. It's the same guy he's always been. Yeah. He has never been relevant. I don't <laughs> understand why people even care. Cargo <laughs> shorts guy is not relevant. He's the guy wearing shorts whether it's thirty degrees out or 110 degrees out. <laughs> <laughs> you literally just he, described it. I'm just saying, he has never been relevant in any conversation. <laughs> I don't know why we care about him now. And I, and Dominic, to settle, to settle things, I'm pretty sure Hillary Clinton would wear cargo shorts before Donald Trump. True. I'm just I, saying, I think she has more manly legs than he does. I actually and, think that Hillary would be a jorts kind of person. So... You need to stop trying to make George Probably happen, right. okay? <laughs> you, you're the only person trying to make that a thing, and you need to stop. Okay, last thought on this before Are we get we started surprised? on our actual Miami wait, Vice wait. podcast here. I, I did also want to hold suggest on, that John Are we definitely surprised? wore in short. You just probably couldn't tell because his legs just still look like they're like he's wearing pants. So <laughs> it's unfortunate, but I'm pretty sure he's worn shorts. Like you do own shorts, right, John? I do own shorts, but they're mostly for show. <laughs> <laughs> just in case someone were to inspect your closet <laughs> you look like a normal guy who recognizes a warm day so my last thought on this before we get started with our actual miami vice talk is the alternative to so there's an anti jorts and then anti cargo pants shorts so the the literal alternative is you can't wear cutoffs so the so like there's plenty of options out there essentially cargo shorts without the cargo what you're complaining what everyone's complaining about now with cargo shorts they'll be complaining about with regular khaki shorts in a few years it's it's never going to end. We can't, we don't know how to dress and everyone should just get off our backs and let us do what we want. Last thing, last thing. Are we surprised Leonardo DiCaprio is short sky? No. <laughs> is that, at is all. that a surprise at all? This no. is a guy who spends, who spends three quarters of the year on a giant yacht. Are we surprised he's a short sky? Well, so I, I have one last thing to add and it's only because this has my, been my experience. Okay. Is that, the shorts thing, it's going to die out. It's not going to transition to a new, like, making fun of or having a problem with a new type of shorts. If it's any indication within my household, what it'll transition to is the, like, the cargo jacket. Because <laughs> Dan got a winter coat, and it has, like, 50 pockets. And I think it's ridiculous, and I don't want him to wear it anywhere. But every time that we go out and he has to wear it, he ends up holding, like, a number of useful things in those pockets. So it's just, like, trying to... It's basically it's the cargo short argument, but for outer outerwear, your 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 jackets. Well, this is a perfect transition over to our episode, season one, episode thirteen, the milk run, where Dan could easily be a drug mule, which we get introduced to in this episode, a couple of drug mules coming from Colombia. This episode originally premiered on January fourth, nineteen eighty five. We're finding it out of nineteen eighty four, guys. And uh oh, thank let's, God. <laughs> let's <laughs> Let's go on and uh, talk about this episode. 
I'm not going to hide it from the very beginning. I hated this episode. And so I'm going to be the constant anchor weighing down this boat as we move along throughout this episode. So if you hear the lack of enthusiasm in my voice as I describe the episode going forward, I apologize in advance, but I'm actually not sorry because this episode sucked really bad. When we opened up again, we've had so many great cold opens and this one's okay. It wasn't great as some of the other ones that we've seen, but this one's okay. We start off and Legs from ZZ Top is playing and Tubbs and Crockett are hanging out at the airport and Crockett is doing his normal thing where he's uh, eyeballing plenty of women around the airport and Tubbs is doing the same but making everyone feel really uncomfortable while he's doing it. Because he's like oh, soaking wet with sweat. And I think he's, he's all sweaty. He says he's all sweaty because he had to go work customs Well. Crockett got to sit in the airport and watch the uh, terminals. It yeah. makes me wonder, why are why are they making people go through customs in a boiler room? <laughs> Crockett mentions it at the end of this of this open where he's, he jokes that maybe Tubbs has like a, a glandular problem or a hormonal problem. And I'm starting to think he does because he's like the sweatiest man I have ever seen. He is drenched in sweat this this entire scene. And I don't know if like it almost seems like I, the director said, make him look like he's sweaty. And then someone sprayed him with a hose and then just didn't give him a <laughs> let him walk in after spraying him in the face with a hose. I'm concerned for Tubbs. I think he's got some pituitary gland issue or something because this is an unhealthy when, amount of sweat like, he has on him. I mean, he he's got to be super dehydrated, right? Like, how does he how does he retain enough water to like not pass out all the time? Yeah, I thought that maybe he was and sick. No one else at the airport is sweaty. <laughs> Obviously, I mean. The airport I've ever been to, the AC is always cranked up like past 10, you know? Yeah. Well, you'll find and out that's not true. And he's the only sweaty guy. You'll find out that's not true at every airport when you come land here at the Phoenix airport in August. So the scene here is is that they're staking out, and, I, and they don't really explain why they're staking out the airport, right? They just seem to have a contact at the terminal who will flag them anytime someone's paying cash to fly out, which is amazing to, th to think now that back then you could just pay cash for an airline ticket and never show an ID. Yeah, yeah. and not to mention, do they just hang out? at airports on the weekends like is that just fun for them because i mean they don't airport security clearly doesn't know that they're there they don't ever explain why they're there or who they're actually looking for it just seems like dumb luck they they just fall on these two college kids one of the only good things about this beginning this this open though is that it's what crockett is wearing he's wearing his sunday best purple pants and <laughs> Crockett actually kind of looks great throughout this whole episode because later he's wearing pink pants with a white blazer and like a black mesh shirt. Oh, those so... pink pants were everything. Okay. <laughs> well, what they see is, is they go up the two guys buy a, a ticket for cash to get flagged by one of the people that works at the terminal she tells the duo that like hey these guys just bought cash to go to columbia the two guys that bought the tickets go they're having something to eat and they're having a conversation and Tubbs and crockett just come walking up and sit themselves down at the table and basically give them a rundown like we know what you're gonna go do and trust us it's not worth it as this conversation progresses one of the guys that they're talking to flips the table over and they both go running. When they flip the table over, it Crockett's able to just take off running after him, but Tubbs goes down hard. And one of the other fa favorite part, my favorite part of this scene is that when they show Tubbs, he's on the ground and he's like covered in milk. And so was one of the guys, uh, when they got their food, were they having a glass of milk with their lunch or dinner at the airport? Do they even sell milk at the airport? It's important to I'm keep not... your calcium high, you guys. Come and on. Then I, and then I started thinking about how, how does Tubbs smell at this point then? Because he's drenched in sweat and now covered in milk. That's So that's what I was thinking was that if it's that hot that he's sweating that much, he's got to smell bad just to begin with. But then... On top of it, he's got milk that's now warm and he's covered in it. It's just, <laughs> that can't be good. It's going to be some weird, at, at... like, onion cheese curd. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, at this point of the episode, I'm actually, I actually was thinking something else. I was starting to wonder if this is based on the Tim Allen story, talking about the comedian Tim Allen. So yeah, I don't know anything guys... about... The tool yeah. man? Yes, yeah, if you... 
don't know anything about Tim Allen. He has kind of a history with drugs, coke in particular. In 1978, he was actually arrested at the Kalamazoo Airport for possession of over 650 grams of coke. Damn. What are Damn. you doing in Michigan with that much coke? Exactly. And actually gave up a number of drug dealers in order to get his sentence commuted from life in prison to oh, uh, three shit. to seven, yeah, to a se- three to seven year didn't sentence. Have the tool man? He is. That's what I'm saying. This episode reminds me of this story because he gave up a bunch of dealers so that he only ended up with a three to seven year sentence, and he only actually served two years and four months. So, wow! Wow! Yeah, that's hmm. incredible. Yes. Yeah, that's that's clearly crazy. he Tim the Tool Man Taylor was arrested. By Tubbs and Crockett. You I'm know, surprised that that wasn't like as he became a more notable figure in like the for his acting. I'm surprised that that wasn't something that followed him more closely. Yeah, well, it's actually something that he's actually had one or two other run-ins since then, as far as cocaine, at least rumors of his him using cocaine. I mean, such. when you give up that many people, I, I don't understand how is he how is he not hunted for life. that's more the question i'm interested in (laughs) true well this scene ends with them with both tubs and crockett chasing these two suspects through the airport and it's like a comedy of errors with tubs and crockett when in tubs is slipping on the milk and then he can't get up the stairs because people are blocking crockett's right on their tail and then the two guys split up and crockett picks one and when he picks one he hits a cart full of luggage and then the airport security grabs him did you see the security woman that was running alongside them i did and it was amazing and it like looped (laughs) (laughs) i almost thought for a minute that maybe they didn't tell the miami international airport that they were filming and she was a real security guard chasing crockett with the radio out down through the airport that's what i thought i i assumed that they like didn't get permission or something and they decided that they were still going to film and so they just went for it and she was actually chasing them down (laughs) yeah because she was i mean she was fast she was she was not She's not a built for running, I guess, is what my, <laughs> if I had to choose a body type, she was. She's got little tiny legs, too, but she was, she was keeping step for step with Sunny. Anyway, that was just, it was, it was distracting for me. Well, the, the, the scene ends, the two get away, and Tubbs and Crockett have to explain their actions to the Miami International Airport when we go to our opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're on the street. And once again, it's what's, what's becoming a cliche scene in Miami Vice is one, either Tubbs or Crockett buying a hot dog from a street vendor. So Crockett is there buying a hot dog from a street vendor. And It's not even the only time that they buy a hot dog in this episode. Like, no. at this point, well, his... The, the frequency of visiting hot dog vendors is growing, and I, I'm beginning to get and why concerned. Is, and why is Tub all of a sudden too good for a hot dog? He wasn't too good last week with the dog. <laughs> yeah, well, Crockett ends up getting three hot dogs in this scene, actually. While he's getting a hot dog, and he has this look of, like, I can't wait to eat this hot dog, this car pulls up behind him, and... It's a, he yells out to Crockett and these two have a history. We learn like a brief story between the two during their conversation that this lawyer, his name is Sloan, who's a public defender. Currently he, in the near future, he says he's going to have his own private law firm, but he just pulls up to tease Crockett as he's driving by that he's going to have his own private law firm. And we see that they have a little bit of a history between each other, where there was a court case prior where Sloan was able to get professional witnesses to buy off testimony. That way he can get someone that crockett ha- had arrested out which i have a number a, n- a number of problems with sloan in this episode but in particular with this scene where we have just him come out of the blue and they you hear this history where in all of the episodes we've watched so far they could have easily made one of those lawyers sloan and we would understand why they have a bad history where he got s- someone off but instead we have this act of god come down and and deliver us Sloan, the public defender lawyer driving a Ferrari. Yeah. How many public See, my, defenders she, do you know that drive Ferraris? Yeah, Are they usually well, in and, like a 1982 Corolla? 
<laughs> Volvo. <laughs> yeah, no, that's my issue with this guy. He's a public defender, and for reasons I will not go into, if you have ever met a public defender and relied on one, you will realize that they are very overworked and very incompetent. So the fact that he actually went out of his way to hire witnesses makes me extremely skeptical. Yeah, you know, and like I said, last week in Little Prince, we had they had an opportunity. There was a lawyer, there was a slime bag lawyer that wanted to get the duo to introduce, you know, to, to state who their informant was. They could have easily made Sloan that lawyer and that we would understand from just a week before why Sloan is such a slime bag. But instead, we get a 30 second scene between Sloan saying how great he is and and Crockett only thinking about hot dogs the entire time. That's very strange in the fact that and it makes you wonder again in what order were these episodes actually filmed versus actually released true true and this scene ends with just a brief where crockett says he tells tubbs let's go get a drink and tubbs says like now sorry man Castillo caught me there in the office and we have to work a stakeout tonight. So Tubbs and Crockett are off to go do some surveillance on a on a warehouse that night. And we jump back to the airport where our two criminals who are flying to Columbia to go pick up cocaine, the ones that were from the opening who ran away from Tubbs and Crockett, they're having a conversation out in front of the airport. And it basically just came down to is that one of the guys who ends up being Eddie is real nervous about going to Colombia and buying these drugs. Martinez, the other guy, is telling him, like, look, man, it's just one score. We're going to get rich off this one score, and then, then we'll be able to get out. E- Eddie ends up conceding, gets on the airplane, and heads to Colombia. We go back to... So now we... So that's all taken care of we know what these guys are up to they want just one score they're they're gonna get rich they're not even from miami they're from new york and basically you know every college kid from new york knows colombian drug dealer it's just common knowledge well as common as tubs being jamaican (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man. well we go from there to where Tubbs and crockett are having their stakeout and this is i mean i'm moving fast because these scenes are really boring and this one is no <laughs> exception <laughs> the this scene they're just hanging out Tubbs and crockett are hanging out in his ferrari and they're just watching no one's come they are um and i'm sorry this stakeout happened a little bit before our airport scene too so the airport scene sandwiched in between the two st- stakeout scenes but for a long time sunny and ricardo are just sitting there they're just talking there's nothing going on in fact croc is even struggling to stay awake which is essentially what i was doing while i was watching this scene and and croc actually kind of in, in a very brief way gives a recap of his issue with uh sloan the lawyer and what happened at the airport which i thought was kind of funny c- considering i mean we just saw it. It's like getting a rap song at the end of a movie, recapping the entire movie. That's essentially what we got out of <laughs> Yeah, except at scene three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After but, waiting for so long, people finally show up. And so not only are we watching this really strange house with a link fence and, and barbed wire on top of the fence. Very non-suspicious looking house. We see yes. a gang of guys go in and moments later, the house just go explodes like crazy Dude, it was like it was hit by a nuclear bomb there's there's no other way to it there was multiple explosions it 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 looked like a house from a godzilla movie that's how bad this thing blew up yeah it's like they had extra money in their budget and they're like just buy more tnt we want this to be big. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and miraculously, all it blew up was that house and then a car that was out in front of the house. It didn't damage any of the houses around or anything. So right after the explosion, after these guys walk in and there's this giant explosion, uh, the fire truck is there and multiple ambulances are there. And Castillo, Zito, and Switex show up to talk to Crockett and Tubbs. Crockett mentions that so- he he- heard w- one of them, one of the guys mentioned Moya before he died there at the scene. We don't see this we just go off what crockett said and they also say that this guy survived the explosion at first and then died after saying moya and then died and now here we are we finally have a hook into how all this stuff is going to come together 
How fortunate. Yeah, and let me recap how this scene ends. It ends with a park ranger who's there for some unknown reason <laughs> informing us about drugs <laughs> inside of statues and yeah. what their current worth is. Yeah, um, so I, tech I want you like, to hey, remember. What's, what's with the statues? And like, oh, that's a Santeria thing. They still had, they don't put, put together at this point that the drugs were inside the statues, even though the park ranger finds the drugs next to the statues and there's a bunch of the same exact statues all right next to each other. Fun fact about yes. the statues, they are in the the Grand Theft Auto oh, one nice. that's inspired. Yeah, I thought they looked familiar and I was reading through the like hey. the facts for the episode and it and it said that it is from the from this episode that they pulled it. Since you actually did some research, can I ask you, is <laughs> Sub's little factoid about it being Nigerian, but adopted by Colombians, is that true? Is that actually some like Nigerian god statue? I didn't see anything about that. I like I just saw that they were just tiki statues. Yeah. I, I'm going to fact check not it like because it, that like sounds extremely sub- suspicious. Well, after the B team, Castillo, and our crime fighting duo put together that the house blew up from drugs and it was so sophisticated, it even had a computer. We star wipe to Bogota, Colombia, where Eddie is making a deal for the drugs. He's buying them, and we get a lo- nice extended scene here where the dealer is showing him how he makes the statues, even though Eddie's only task is to pick up the statue there in Colombia and bring it to the U.S. and sell it to what ends up being Diego Moya. So we have this long scene where he shows him how he's building the statues, the same statues that are in that that were in that house explosion. But the scene is really awkward because the Colombian is kind of trying to be nice and explain to him, and Eddie is kind of being a douche to him, even though he's being he is a drug mule at this point. Yeah, yeah. Once mean, again, like... goes back to the fact that every college kid knows a Colombian drug drug dealer. I mean, the the scene is kind of long for for the information that you get out of it. You hear Eddie say that his his contact is a friend of a friend. We get a nice, real good I- introduction how you can sneak drugs inside of a statue. That was nice. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of information we get out of this scene. So we do another Star Wars star wipe out of Bogota and go back to South Beach. In this whole time, we haven't seen how these stories are going to link together. We we know that when the house explosion, someone said Moya, but our Eddie and Martinez, we don't know who their contact is. Neither of them have said who their contact is to this episode. So we don't know how these things, we still don't know how these things are going to fit together. Just as the audience were kind of able to like, I think this and I think that, but nothing has really come together. The reason why they're let me is- ask, Let me ask one question and I just will come back to it at the end of the episode. But ask yourself, why did that group of guys get blown up in that house? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That is a fantastic question because it doesn't because it never gets answered. It never gets answered. We never are they competing drug dealers? Did they rip <laughs> off their statue idea? And we we know, never know. We know by the end that Diego Moya likes to kill his runners that are like they're they're in over the head. They don't understand how it you know how it works. It's just a scam. But that house blows up with drugs in it. Why blow up your own drugs? Why not just show up and shoot them too? I don't know. The reason Get out of why... here with your logic. <laughs> 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 well, the reason why we go down to South Beach in this scene is because Crockett is just going down to talk to someone who, a woman that he's dealt with before, that he's arrested before, but she happens to know some stuff about Santeria. Is that why they're going down to talk to her? He's right. like contact of hers or something. So like we meet her, she comes completely out left field as some snitch of his. Mm-hmm. And I am extremely more interested in the gang she hangs out with because I'm trying to figure out if they're the Jets or the Sharks. I also can't figure out because we find out later that Moya is buying chemicals from her boyfriend. I was like, what does her boyfriend do? He's selling uh, Moya acetone and something else. It's like, okay, so what's the angle on this gang? Is this gang like a gang of biologists and chemists and they just sell stuff on the street? They just sell ke- chemicals on the street? But at any point in time, they're going to break out into snapping and singing uh, <laughs> songs from West Side Story. So what happens is, is that Tubbs and Crockett are there. They're hanging out. They're just lo- lo- looking at this theater. The Angela is her name. She works there and she's going to work. But her boyfriend and his gang are hanging out in front. Tubbs and Crockett do a coin flip to see who's going to go distract the boyfriend because he looks like it's someone who, as Tubbs says, wouldn't like the 
the, the certain people talking to his girlfriend after the even though Crockett is Angela's contact. So the, I don't see how Tubbs ever thought that this was going to be a time where he could go talk to Angela and she would be receptive to talking to him, even though it's Cro Cro Crockett's contact. But after a coin flip, Tubbs has to go distract the boyfriend while Crockett goes and talks to Angela. He Crockett walks up and basically just yells at her for like 30 seconds until she says that she's aware of someone named Diego Moya and from other from the people from her boyfriend's gang mentioning him. And he's connected to some gym down in South Beach. But on the other side, Tubbs is distracting the boyfriend, which is getting out of control. Crockett sees that, goes running for his car, jumps in the Ferrari, pulls up front. And while Angela's boyfriend's pulling on Tubbs' tie, he turns, vaults off of one of the motorcycles into the Ferrari and yells out, Edwin Moses, and they drive away. Now, if someone will please explain to me what the fuck any of that meant, I'm all ears. I don't know, but we're starting to see why Tubbs is always so sweaty. <laughs> i i don't know what does that mean what is edwin moses why did he just yell that out for no reason while when, when he jumped into the car i don't know i mean am I missing bubba something? Bubba Booey. yeah am i missing something from their conversation i'm reading about edwin moses now and he's a former track and field athlete who won gold medals in the 400 meter hurdles at the 1976 olympics this makes even less sense unless he said that because he jumped over the motorcycle into the car, but he didn't even jump over it. He vaulted off of it. I, I, can't, I can't hold it together through this episode. Maybe it's he so had stupid. an affinity for <laughs> leather jackets. No, I mean, he's clearly trying to set the precedent that he's also a track and field star. Just we, we should move past it. Also, um, on a side note. Distracting, distracting. <laughs> uh, Eric Bogosian is Zeke, the boyfriend, mm. and we know him from such things as Law and Order: Criminal Intent. Though I feel like knowing someone from Law and Order is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like knowing someone from Miami Vice. Like everybody's been on there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but he also wrote and starred in a play, Talk Radio, that was then made into a movie, and I think that that's like one of his most well-known things mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. at the end of this scene we do another star wars star white down to moya's gym the duo come walking into the gym it's a boxing gym so there's a little bit of a build up where there's some guys that are boxing and they look like they're actually from that gym because they look like they're pretty amped up to have cameras there they're working hard in the in, in there there's a couple guys sparring in the ring and they're they're fighting pretty hard when Tom got Crockett, the pat penitar crank, cranked up yeah it, it was almost like a rocky moment right no, nothing gets me more pumped when i'm working out than pat benatar they come walking in and as they walk in this there just happened to be a used car salesman wandering through the gym as as well and this turns out to be diego moya's brother who they have a very pleasant conversation with this moya they find out from him that diego moya will be at a fight later tonight because one of his guys is fighting is going to have a fight that night and they have a very pleasant con conversation to be honest with you i kind of like this moya he was a nice guy in the middle of the scene Tubbs starts looking around at the back door mind you no one ever walks by the door never opens but Tubbs says, hey, we got to go. I think I just saw Martinez run out the back door. Crockett and Tubbs run out on the used car salesman and go running out the back door just in time to see Martinez get inside of a cab and drive away. Tubbs and Crockett run to their Ferrari and take off to follow the taxi to see where it's going. Basically, Tubbs is either able to see through walls or Martinez briefly turned invisible while floating through the gym out the back door. I mean, at this point, I think it may be worthwhile for us to just collectively list out, like, find time and list out all of the ways that prove that Tubbs is, in fact, a superhero. There's compelling <laughs> evidence there. We, oh, yeah. We've just, we just haven't aggregated it. Like, we just need to put it together, and then we'll see. <laughs> I mean, we, I did talk about last week that Tubbs is a good police officer. So maybe Martinez was crawl, army crawling, trying to sneak past, and Tubbs was <laughs> able to see that out of the corner of his tiger eye and see him running for the back door i mean that sounds like a perfectly reasonable explanation actually i think that you just solved the mystery <laughs> well while they're they're following the cab and they see that the cab is taking him to the hotel called the senator which is an older hotel looks like it's we're still in south beach martinez goes inside and so do tubs and crockett when they get inside they're talking to, to someone at the front desk no one is checked in under the name martinez 
or uh, Moya. There's no there's no information about anyone saying this. So they don't know what room he's in. But just so happens that as they're doing that, Eddie is just coming back in from the airport, going to the hotel with the statue full of drugs. He sees Crockett and Tubbs and turns heel and starts and runs out the front door. Tubbs and Crockett give chase. They catch him right when he's going to get into a taxi cab. They pull him out. They start handcuffing him. And Eddie, like a dumbass, just says, I thought this. I thought I was just buying a souvenir. Even though Tubbs and Crockett have no information on why he would have that statue or if there'd be any drugs inside of it, he just blurts out with no lawyer present. I thought it was a souvenir. He was the lesser Yeah, and I think Just let him go. I think, though, Tubbs and Crockett had to catch him this time because if he got away again, like, that would just be embarrassing. After the Edwin Moses comment, like, you would hope that they would be able to catch him. But earlier in the episode, Tubbs clearly proved that he is not the chasing type. Dude, I was waiting. That cabbie was getting ready to beat someone's ass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, now that was someone that I thought was going to get shit done because he jumped into his cab and told him to drive and the cabbie hopped out like, get the fuck out of my cab. And then when he saw Tubbs and Crockett, he was ready to take them on, too. Oh, yeah, man. He was going to he was going to knock some people out. We jump back to the precinct and Crockett has finally put together what the statues are for, that they're putting drugs inside of the statues. And Castillo is telling him he wants surveillance on the gym because he's saying, like, we saw Martinez leave from there. We picked up Eddie so we can put two and two together that somehow the Moyas are involved with this drug deal and they're smuggling drugs inside of these statues. Tubbs is busy so in, another in side interrogating note. Eddie to see if they can get a, any information out of him. So side note about Eddie, apparently, even though he's from New York, he has a membership at that boxing gym. Convenient. Just, you know, throwing that out there because, I mean, <laughs> obviously Martinez would know the Moyas. In this scene, too, I can start to see the trend in Tubbs or Crockett's interrogation techniques because they seem to always go to the same point. And in t- during Tubbs' interrogation, he makes a veiled threat about to Eddie saying, like, you don't want to go to jail because if you're not going to give us any information, how about we put you in a cell with another lonely inmate? It seems pretty consistent that every time they interrogate someone, they make a veiled threat that they're going to put them in prison so that they can get raped. Yeah, a lot Nothing of uh, like innuendo. play to make you give up all your secret i mean <laughs> well it always seems shot. to be coming from crockett too yeah yeah well this time it was tough and later in the episode there will be another instance where crockett will make another threat about being raped in prison that's definitely on their it's like in their first five points that they try and use to, in, during their interrogation techniques during this interrogation crockett just late he he comes in he just lays it down like look you're a young kid either you're going to jail you committed a really bad felony either you're going to jail or you're going to start naming names and i can promise you that you won't go to jail eddie finally breaks down and he just yells out or lo- my lawyer said that you would try and do this i can't tell you anything and then says that his lawyer's name is sloan so now everything's starting to come together in a neat little package boop, boop, boop. <laughs> of course crockett and tubbs take off right out of them they head to a bar which i guess is a bar n- that where sloan is known to hang out and we're we, we get dropped into a scene where sloan is act as a lawyer who is actively sexually harassing a woman behind the bar and then crockett comes up and grabs him and forcibly removes him from the bar if there were things i would say i wouldn't do to a lawyer it would be assault because i think a lawyer would be able to handle you pretty good with in this scene they he grabs sloan and pulls him outside, throws it against the table. He's pissed. Crockett is pissed at Sloan because he he said that, you know, it's like, I never go back on my word. I told him that, like, he would, I would get him out. Like, he wouldn't have to serve any time in jail. Why are you telling him to be quiet? And Crockett is really starting to show that he's really concerned about Eddie. He's worried that he's going to try and take a fall for this. And he's, he's in over his head. He's only 19. He shouldn't be doing this. And then Crockett makes another veiled threat about being prison raped where he says that someone like Eddie would be, quote, passed around like a pack of smokes i'm serious well, that uh, very mean, unpleasant th- <laughs> this is starting to starting to make me question crockett's fantasy life <laughs> i was taking a drink of water at the same time <laughs> they grab sloan and just drag him out of there and take him back to the precinct and this is, all this is very odd and and i'm even having a hard time following what's happening here they drag this lawyer uh, almost forcibly back to talk to Eddie. They drop Sloan in the chair. Sloan says a couple of words 
And Crockett interrupts him. So I tell him about how I lied and tell him about how I won't keep my word. And Sloan just looks at him. Crockett says, all right, get out of here. Slo they drag Sloan out of there. And Crockett's like, just gives him, just gives Eddie a look like, okay, let's talk. Let's make a deal now. You know you can trust me. Pretty much the whole storyline with Sloan the lawyer, Sloan doesn't turn out to be any big bad guy or anything. He just turns out to be a douchebag. So it's just basically his whole storyline is completely useless. Yeah, I don't understand why there was this big build for this sleazebag lawyer, and he ended up not being a consistent part in this episode. All only thing he was good at in this whole episode was interrupting hot dog eating. <laughs> Which at the frequency that they're eating hot dogs is not hard to do. <laughs> Most conversations you're going to have with either Tubbs or Crockett at this point is going to be at or around a hot dog stand. I just imagine that if you want to have a serious conversation with one of them, you just have to deal with the fact that they have a hot dog shoved in their mouth at the same time. Maybe we're <laughs> on to something, you guys, because there's a there's a, a high amount of, uh, or a close proximity to hot dog stands, right? Lots of eating of hot dogs, and many, many, many veiled homosexual threats. <laughs> 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 now we're he we're heading towards the end of this episode. We're we're coming to where they're gonna they're gonna try and force the, this bust on whoever Eddie and Martinez are doing their deal with. They use Eddie to go to back to the senator to go knock on the door. That way they can get in and and get Martinez in on this deal. So they show up. Eddie knocks on the door. When Martinez opens the door, the vice team pushes their way in they give the breakdown to martinez of what's happening martinez is upset that eddie had ratted him out but they eventually convince eddie and martinez like look like here's the deal we're gonna go through with this with this deal you're gonna have whoever your dealer is gonna come in they're gonna buy it from you and then we're gonna make an arrest by doing this this means that neither of you are gonna go to jail and again this we hit home for uh, like a third time how concerned Crockett is for Eddie. He never seems to show any remorse for Martinez, but he's always concerned about Eddie. Yeah, so as the scene continues, so they go around to the other to the other room and you know, you get the scene of the sniper setting up and everything. And then the scene goes very much Pulp Fiction style when these two guys show up for the meeting, like almost to the point where I'm wondering if they were act if they were also talking about foot massages in the hallway. <laughs> yeah, because there was um, there's this build up where you see more vice cops show up. Zito and Switek are stationed out. Switek's working behind the counter. Zito's in the cab out front. Some police officer snipers spread out crockett gives them a rundown like look they're gonna come in you stay against the wall stay out of view of the window leave the drugs inside the refrigerator until until you absolutely have to take it out basically stay out of the way because we're gonna shoot this fucker this mm -hmm. cab shows up and two suits jump out now these guys these guys that come out of the cab that are gonna go make this deal they look amazing and you're right like this pulp fiction kind of mention but also like they're dressed the same. They're both wearing the exact same suit, carrying the exact same briefcase. Except for one of them is Colombian, who ends up being Diego Moya. And then another one's this white, just this rando white guy with a serious porn star mustache. Oh, yeah. It is very, you know, I made the Pulp Fiction connection, but it's like Pulp Fiction meets Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> because they're in those like disco style white suits. So they, they go upstairs and there's no words spoken. Moya and this guy come in. They knock on the door. They come into the room. Eddie and Martinez are sitting with their backs against the wall. No words are exchanged. Moya opens up the briefcase, turns around, shows them the cash. Eddie opens up the refrigerator, pulls the drugs out, sets it on the table. Moya pulls the statue out, pulls the drugs out from the bottom, which makes me think, why are they making the statue, putting the drugs in and then merging the statue together from two pieces when they could have just stuffed it in from the bottom? There's a hole in the bottom. I thought for sure there'd be, there'd be a, something on the bottom to hold it in. That way you wouldn't just be able to look inside and go like, huh, I wonder what this plastic bag is in the bottom of this statue. But he pulls the drugs out, looks at it, everything's good. Moya stands up and turns around. When he turns around, he pulls a gun out from his waistband, turns around and goes to shoot Eddie. At the last second before Moya gets the shot off, the police sniper shoots Moya right in the back, and the vice team busts in and grabs the other, the porn star, and holds him down, and they're able to make their arrest. Right before the scene ends, T uh, Crockett asks Eddie, he's like, Moya? And Eddie shakes his head like, yep, that's Moya, which turns out to be Diego Moya. See, now I'm getting my Moyas confused. So that one's Diego Moya, and then the uh, the one that follows the B team after this, that's the other Moya? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Pepe Moya. Okay. Yeah, I was Just making sure I don't get my Moya backwards. Yeah, no, I was I was really confused at at the end of this scene. Like, who was who? I couldn't, I didn't even, at, 
there was a point in time where I didn't think it was a Moya at all. I thought it was someone else. It was it was really confusing about who was maybe who and they're them being the brothers. people that maybe the, it's the real people who blew up the house. <laughs> yeah, now, it's definitely a Moya because they say Castillo comes. He shows up during the cleanup afterwards. He says that he wants surveillance at the airport. He also wants sur- surveillance over Eddie and Martinez. They're going to go put him in a safe house, and then they're going to catch a flight back to New York later that night. Crockett's on the phone with Angela, trying to find out where the other, like, what the Moyas are up to, because now they know their buyer from the New York kids is a Moya. So now they've done all this work on Moyas, and then they've done all this with these two, with, with Eddie and Martinez, but now they finally put it all together, that there was drugs in the statues that they were buying from Columbia. They were flying them back from Colombia and selling them to the Moya brothers. So now they want to know more about what the Moya brothers are up to. Crockett calls Angela and they find out that there's a fight going on tonight that the other Moya brother is going to be there and she doesn't know Pepe Moya, but she knows someone who can help point him out while there. Castillo, again, he assigns the B team to go watch Eddie and Martinez. They're going to go stay at a safe house and then that night they're going to go fly out. We head to the fight where the Moyas, uh, the Moya gym where they're having the fight and they meet up with with Angela and Crockett, and Crockett gets Angela to meet them in the back room. When they go to the back room, Crockett's just yelling at Angela, like, we want to know more about Moya. We want to know what Pepe's up to. And all Angela can say is that she knows that her boyfriend knows because she's heard that he's been selling chemicals to Pepe. Right at that point, her, her boyfriend, Zeke, busts in. Crockett lays a sweet body punch on him and takes him down. After a few shouting matches Zeke finally concedes that Pepe has been buying acetone and some some other chemical from him and he doesn't know what they've been doing with it but he can tell them where the house is that they do where their main lab is I guess is what I'm saying oh without having to threaten to have him right <laughs> yeah. so uh definitely getting better at at these interrogations <laughs> We have a didn't brief, even have to threaten to rape him. We have a brief scene. We have two brief scenes here to set up for our final scene of the episode. We go to the precinct where, they're given the, where the duo's given the rundown to Castillo. Castillo says, like, hey, look, you guys have done a great job. Why don't you go relieve the B team and go take Eddie and Martinez or Lewis, Eddie and Lewis, to the airport and get them home. And they're like, no, we don't really want to do that. And Castillo's like, look, you guys have done a good job. Just take it. I'm giving you the milk run. And I was like, ha, that's the name of the episode. Milk run. I'm having a good time now. Do you know the episode of Family Guy where they reference that? Where they reference like the feeling that you get when you find out the title of something like <laughs> while you're in the movie? Yes. I yeah. think of that. I was uh-huh. actually just talking to Dan about that. How often I think of that as I'm like reading <laughs> books or watching movies or whatever. And every single time I'm like, there it is. And I want to get up and just walk out. And I thought the exact same thing <laughs> when he said, I'm giving you the milk run. I was like, that's it. <laughs> End the episode. Good job, guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs> well, the other brief scene is, is we see that the B team are hanging out with Lewis and Eddie at the safe house. They're playing Monopoly. There's another attempt at B team's Y Tech and Zeno at comedy. At this point, I don't have the energy to go through whatever was happening in this room. <laughs> just. <laughs> It wasn't good. Well, it let's just matter. say they're camping. It we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it's just getting sad now. Like, I just feel so- Tubbs and Crockett show up. They relieve the B team and they pick up Lewis and Eddie to go take them to the airport. Of course, when they show up to the airport, they aren't being inconspicuous at all. They pull up. They're in a convertible. They're having loud conversations. They just walk into the into the airport. And I forgot to mention, in the scene where just previous, we see right before at the end of the cleanup from the hotel where Crockett, where Diego Moya had been killed, there's a brief scene where you see Pe- Pepe sitting in a van just glaring at the police officers. So we know in this final scene, Pepe is there to clean up the mess that is that happened in the fallout from his brother being killed. So we jump back to the airport and out of nowhere Billy D. Williams pops out with a shotgun and starts laying <laughs> fools down. <laughs> laying yes. that was going nuts. It's a trap. <laughs> Yeah, there is. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Wait, you guys, did I just successfully execute a Star Wars joke? Yes, I might need to take my yes. headset off and just yes, you did. Done. I'm so. I proud. am so proud of you. I'm so proud. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, so yeah. proud of you right there, now. There, there it is, you guys. Call it. <laughs> End of the episode. They're in this, like, duty-free shop, right? And Eddie and Lewis are walking around, and Croc is being a nice guy again, right? He's going to buy them. He's going to pay for their stuff that they need for the airplane on their way home. Eddie grabs a newspaper and walks up close to the window that's in the front of the duty-free shop and he turns and sees Lando Car- Carlucian on the other side of the window with a shotgun who fires and makes a perfect bullet hole through the glass, not shattering it into a million pieces at first. You know, it's not like a real shotgun. He shoots and kills Eddie. In what is by far one of the greatest stunt double like horror shows I've ever seen. <laughs> that, was that dude wearing glasses uh, when he fell over? <laughs> like safety glasses? Hey, if you're gonna get shot, bring the safety goggles. That's important. <laughs> it's just like like a completely different person and he's wearing other shit. Like that like how do you how do you fuck that up? Uh, my, my favorite part is is that the they keep cutting to tubs chasing Lando down through the airport and they're filming like up at him so all you see is like his shoulders moving and, and him doing this like brisk dog through the airport it is just <laughs> hilarious like this awkward i don't even know if he's actually running or if they're just filming him moving his arms back and forth <laughs> he looked like he was just power walking <laughs> he was on he was on a brief jog it's just a jaunt through the airport we had tackled lewis and tubbs took off after pepe there's a brief chase where tubbs is getting his his leg he's stretching his legs a little bit and doing a brisk walk through the airport he eventually comes on pepe who had just stopped in a corner some random corner instead of and it was a door there's a door behind him instead of running out the door and leaving the airport he waits for tubbs tubbs nonchalantly runs over to the corner of the wall kneels down takes aim and shoots and, and kills pepe in one shot i was really hoping for kind of one of those like what it uh, like Inigo Montoya for him to be like, you killed my brother. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs> like that's why he wasn't going to go out the door because he just wanted to deliver that one sick line. This, I mean, we get to, we're at the end here now. You know, right? Both Diego and Pepe are dead. Vice strike again. They've killed every every person they need to interrogate to find out more information about where these drugs are coming from and where they're going. And in the process, they sacrifice one of the people who helped them bring this cartel down. The only thing that we get out of it, the only benefit we get out of this is in the final scene, we see just how broken up Sonny is over Eddie being shot and killed. And again, he has no concern for Lu- for Lewis whatsoever, but he is really broken up over Eddie being shot. I was so sad by this. Like, sad Crockett breaks my heart. And he was so invested. And I thought, I actually thought, I mean... I liked the episode and I thought that this was really well done. Um, and it, it broke my heart. I just, I wanted to give Crockett a hug. This was the only part of the episode I felt was any good because Brock is really sad. He's sitting on the ground and Tubbs tells him, he's like, hey, you know, let's go to the car. And Crockett goes, yeah, let's go to the car. And Tubbs just looks at him. He sees him. And so he sits down next to him and he just sits there with them. And it's like, okay, cool. Like Tubbs, Tubbs and Crockett are actually really good friends at this point tubs always has his back <laughs> so just to point out we still don't know why they blew the house up or who blew the house up <laughs> i'm really hoping they address it in the next episode because I, I i'm starting to be concerned that there's someone going around just blowing houses up in miami <laughs> That's going to do it for this roundup on the episode. There is a couple of good songs from this episode, so let's uh, let's wrap this up and move on to the music. All right, John, I am thoroughly exhausted from reliving that episode. Please pick my spirits back up with the music that is from this episode, because we do start strong. I love ZZ Top. There, there are two songs in the episode, and there are two very strong songs. We have Legs by ZZ Top, which was on the Eliminator album and was released in 1984, and that's in the open. And then we have Hit Me With Your Best Shot, Pat Benatar, that was released in 79 on the album Crimes of Passion, and that is from the scene at the gym. Now, I could go into talking about, because these are two very big songs, very big for the artists. They both charted in their top 10. It was actually Pat Benatar's first top 10 hit. Little side note, Hit Me With Your Best Shot was actually written by a Canadian uh, named Eddie Shorts, who came up with the title after a pillow punching therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most Canadian thing I've ever heard. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. That you, you did not hear that wrong. That is a very Canadian way. He was leaving a pillow punching therapy session when he wrote the song. I could also talk about the fact that Pat Be- that same song, Pat Benatar's Hit Me With Your Best Shot, was also used by Pizza Hut during a promotion where you would get a free compilation CD with every order. I could talk <laughs> about that a little bit too. <laughs> But what I really want to talk about in the music is that both of these songs, even though seemingly completely different, being a ZZ Top song and a Pat Benatar song, completely different artists, they have one very, one thing in common. And I'm going to ask you both, you know what that is? Hmm. No. I can't even guess. That is that both songs were covered by Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> Pat Benatar. <laughs> Benatar's was co- uh, was covered by the Chipmunks for their 1982 album Chipmunk Rock, <laughs> and then Le- Legs by ZZ Top was covered by them in 1985 as well. There is so no time in my life that I will ever believe it's appropriate for Legs to be sung by the Chipmunks. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. That was extremely surprising to me. That is why that is the main focus of the music section today is that I want to now listen to the Alvin and Chipmunks version of Legs. If you've ever listened to a ZZ Top song, all those old guys sing, uh, all those guys sing about is sex and women. And I am just trying to picture ZZ Top's Eliminator Girls dancing around to Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> I'm so creeped out. Like I'm, I can hear, I can hear it in my head, and it's like I'm, I'm just so creeped out. Well, that definitely took a turn in music that I was not anticipating. I feel uh, dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on and close this episode out with our closing thoughts. All right, so I've made no hidden. No, I've not hidden anything here on how much I dislike this episode. I'll start us off with talking about you know uh, what my final thoughts are on this episode, and then I'll turn this over to uh, to you and John. What I found lacking in this episode was the the story didn't really make a whole bunch of sense, and there's still so many questions out there about where people came from. This the whole introduction of Sloan made me actually almost kind of angry in the beginning because there was opportunities for a better show that would have introduced Sloan earlier, and they, they they didn't get rid of him. And knowing from notes and talking to and talking to my wife, Sloan doesn't necessarily. I don't think he comes back in the whole series. So they introduce him out of nowhere. He's barely used in the episode, and then they drop him. So I'm not. Just from the very beginning on how Sloan became introduced through the entire episode with the house blowing up and never getting any closure on that, both Pepe and Diego being killed and Eddie being killed. I didn't really feel for any of these characters, didn't have any backstory. It would have been nice maybe here and there to get some backstory on Lewis or Eddie, but we don't get any of that. We don't get any backstory on the Moyas. We get nothing. We just kind of have this moment in time. The director of this episode, though, and what I'll close out with my closing thoughts, his name is John Nicoella. And unfortunately, he directs a number. This was his first episode he directed for Miami Vice, but he ends up directing eight more through the rest of season one and into season two. And I'm sad to say he's also the director for the episode Phil the Shill, which Jenna, I hate to break your heart, but that's the episode that Phil Collins is in. And this is the director that's that does this episode. No. <laughs> John Nicolella ends up being replaced as a line producer for the show as well by Dick Wolf. So there is hope for season three when they finally get rid of him. Oh, right on. I love Dick Wolf stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I didn't feel nearly as strongly as you. Uh, I actually thought the episode was, was pretty good. Um, I do agree that they, like, so... The writers of the show seem to have a problem with creating great tertiary characters. Like they're starting to build out, though arguably could be do could be doing a lot more to build out like the main players, uh, Crockett and Tubbs, and and even beyond to like Castillo or Trudy and Gina and Switek and Zito. But I think that they're working toward that. Like you see more like Trudy and Gina forward episodes or ones where uh, Zito and Switek seem to start 
having a much more regular cadence. Um, I mean, like, they're annoying characters to me, but, like, I am seeing them more often and learning more about their weird relationship. But the characters that come that are really just meant for one episode are typically really awful. They're they're super flat, and there are often way too many of them in the case such as, like, with Sloane. I mean, I thought that maybe, and, and I guess so you just confirmed it for me, that he, he was brought in and introduced, but, like, lightly introduced because because they plan on making his character more present throughout but if they don't then that's just completely pointless like he wasn't a strong character his whole storyline didn't make any sense like i was really willing to look past it for th- the fact that like his character would just start becoming more regular on the show and i'd fi- find out more around why he was being introduced but if he if he's not then that's just horrible and and it's just, it, it ends up just being noisy and distracting having all of these extras like uh, with Angela and Zeke and the the two runners and then the Moyas and like all of their cartel and the things that they've got going on. It's just so many extra characters that distract from the main point of the story. That said, I really did like the two the two runner guys, um, especially the what is it? Eddie is the one that gets shot. Mm-hmm. Um I really liked his character. I liked it and grew to to feel the same sort of uh, care that that they were trying to evoke with his relationship with Crockett. Um, and so I, I was I was sad when he got shot and very very sad to see Crockett sad. I want Crockett to be happy. I love Crockett happy and on a boat. So <laughs> uh, always disappointing when it doesn't end that way. But meh. All right, John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, I actually somewhat enjoyed this episode. And I don't know, there was something simpler about this episode. There was a lack of of complication that I feel like came from not having Gina or Trudy in the episode causing <laughs> problems. So <laughs> I feel like that elevated this episode in my mind. But aside from that, after watching this episode and doing the research for the for the music, I am now, as we speak, Googling Alvin and Chipmunks albums, trying to find the most inappropriate Alvin and Chipmunk song to share with you guys. <laughs> so, and I will make sure to bring that with me uh, for a future podcast, but I must go now because I am late for a pillow punching therapy <laughs> se- session. I'm really hoping, John, that you find uh, digital underground songs covered by Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oh, yeah. I'm looking like Nine Inch Nails Closer uh, <laughs> by the Alvin and the Chipmunks. Well, that's going to do it for us this week with Season 1, Episode 13, The Milk Run. There's a split. We've had three weeks in a row where John didn't like an episode, Jenna didn't like an episode, and now I didn't like an episode. We appreciate you hanging out with us and listening to the show. Make sure to tell your friends if they might be interested in listening to a fantastic podcast about my, the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Check out our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Find out about all the ways that you can subscribe and follow us on social media at GoWithTheHeat.com slash subscribe. We appreciate you listening and we'll see y'all next week. Bye pals. Rock on. <laughs> <laughs>